Welcome to our video on photosynthesis and cellular respiration. We're going to start by taking a look at the process of photosynthesis. Purpose of this process? To synthesize food or glucose for autotrophs, things like plants. Another way to think about it is photosynthesis takes solar energy, the sun's energy, and it stores it in the carbon-hydrogen bonds of glucose right there. This all happens at chloroplasts, kind of little green hockey pucks inside cells, these things. What organisms carry this process of photosynthesis out? Autotrophs, heterotrophs, both of them, or none? Please don't say none. Definitely autotrophs, but not heterotrophs. Autotrophs, they're called producers because they produce their own food, like this plant cell over here. Heterotrophs, like us and other animals, we don't make our own food. We have to consume stuff. Therefore, we're called consumers. Some possible equations or ways to look at photosynthesis. There's three of them. Let's start with the first one. We know photosynthesis makes glucose. And in order to make glucose with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, you need to get those carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms they come from water and carbon dioxide. Sunlight is going to power this whole process. The carbon and CO2 will join or become part of sugar. The oxygen and carbon dioxide will become part of sugar. So the CO2 you're breathing out right now will become sugar that you or somebody else might eat down the road. The hydrogen and glucose, though, it comes from water and it's bound to oxygen. So the sun will come and split up or break up water into hydrogen and oxygen. That sun splitting water is known as a process called photolysis, light splits, also called photolysis. Now the hydrogen is able to join CO2 and become sugar, C6H12O6. The oxygen will join another oxygen and become O2, the oxygen that we breathe. But photolysis, without that, without the sun splitting water, we would have no glucose, meaning the hydrogen would not be able to join CO2 to make glucose, and we'd have no oxygen to breathe because the oxygen we breathe comes from water. So thank you, the sun. The sun's energy, we said before, is going to be stored right here in the carbon-hydrogen bonds of glucose. This whole process is sped up by proteins, which are represented by the arrow in the middle. These proteins that speed the process up are called enzymes, also known as catalysts. Photosynthesis, it, another way to look at it, it takes solar energy, the sun's radiant energy, and it transforms it or stores it in chemical bond energy, the CH bonds of glucose. Again, that process facilitated or catalyzed by enzymes. Third way to look at this is that all the reactants, the things that go into photosynthesis, the things on the left, water, carbon dioxide, they're all inorganic because they do not contain carbon and hydrogen together. Carbon dioxide just says C, water just says H. So it's carbon and hydrogen, not together. But photosynthesis takes that stuff and makes it into an organic nutrient called glucose, where carbon and hydrogen are together. Anything that's organic must contain carbon and hydrogen. And this process all sped up by enzymes. Looking at this picture, we have a green underwater plant called Elodea. Looks like little air bubbles are coming out of it. Those bubbles are filled with a specific gas coming out of a green plant. Plants we looked at, talked about, they do photosynthesis. So what's the gas that's released as a result of photosynthesis? Oxygen. And if the plant's making those oxygen bubbles, it has to also be making glucose. Because if glucose is made, oxygen has to be made. 
they are always made together. Because you know that hydrogen from water becomes part of glucose and that extra oxygen from water has to go somewhere. It's made into breathable oxygen. So you can't make glucose without making oxygen and vice versa. That makes number three pretty easy then. If plant A makes a lot of oxygen bubbles and plant B makes a few, which one makes more glucose? Plant A, of course, because if there's more oxygen bubbles, that means more photosynthesis is going on, which means more glucose is being made. Can't make one without the other. Let's take a visual look at this process. For that, we have to look at the chloroplasts and we have to slice one open. We're gonna throw a mitochondria in there also. So the chloroplast, the green thing up here, that we said makes glucose and oxygen. And I color coded the letters or the elements, carbon, oxygen, or red, hydrogen, and the other oxygen are blue to show where they come from. In order to make these two things, you need carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They come from carbon dioxide. The red C and red O will become the red C and O of glucose. Water. The blue H and the blue O will enter and become the blue H and carbon and uh, glucose and glucose and the oxygen that we breathe. The whole thing that powers this process, the sun. The sun's energy will come in, and you guys know it will split water. The sun's solar energy ultimately will be stored right there in the carbon hydrogen bonds of glucose and be called stored chemical energy. That energy is not usable by the plants. So photosynthesis, the chloroplast, it will trap solar energy in organic nutrients like glucose. Again, the process is called photosynthesis. We got that. Um, glucose, since that energy can't be used, it has to go to this red thing it's called the mitochondria and be transformed into ATP. And if you just use glucose, you'll make a very small amount to ATP. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is a usable energy, and it can be used to carry out all life functions. So ribosomes could be like, hey, ATP, come here, and it could use it. Ribosomes and other things can't use glucose, but they can use ATP to carry out life functions, which are also called metabolism. In order to make enough ATP, because two ATPs, that's not enough for like a big redwood tree or two ATPs, not enough for us, plants will use oxygen. Yes, plants use oxygen because they need more than two ATP. And when you use oxygen, you'll make 36. Glucose and oxygen, all those elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, they have to go somewhere. So the waste product CO2 is made. This is a plant cell, though. Plants do make CO2 because they use glucose to make ATP. The carbon and oxygen have to go somewhere. But plants don't give off CO2. They're going to hold on to it. They're going to reuse it for more photosynthesis. So yes, plants do make CO2. A lot of people think they don't, they do, but they don't release it. The other waste product that's made, the blue H and the blue O will become water. And there's extra water left over from both these reactions and there's extra oxygen left over because plants, yeah, they use oxygen, but they don't use it all. So they're gonna release extra oxygen and water and let's take a look how. The extra oxygen and water will leave through the bottom of leaves, through tiny little pores called stoma. The cells that flank it on both sides of the stoma, they're called guard cells. They're going to open and close the stoma. A little hole in the middle of the stoma, that's where oxygen will leave. That's where water will leave. And something goes in. Carbon dioxide. Because plants, yeah, they make their own CO2, but they need a lot more. The guard cells open the stoma on wet days because they're filled with water. 
causing the cells to bend sideways because they're so filled. So on a wet day, a lot of exchange of oxygen and CO2 takes place. Extra water is able to be released. But on dry days, those vacuoles inside the plant cells, they don't have a lot of water in them and the cells can't bend open. Therefore, extra water cannot be released. There's no extra water in the first place. So water is going to stay in and be conserved. The guard cells close the stoma on dry days to prevent water loss. This brings up two major ways in which guard cells help maintain homeostasis. The first is that the guard cells close the stoma to regulate water loss. And the guard cells also open the stoma to allow the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So they regulate gas exchange. Those are the two ways guard cells help regulate or maintain homeostasis in a plant. How does water get into a plant? Do you go up to a big tree and get a ladder and water the leaves? No, you water the ground. And when rain falls, it falls on the ground because water leaves through the leaves. It's evaporated out and water enters through the roots. How does it get from the roots to the leaves? Water is going to actually get pulled up as it evaporates out. Each water molecule is a long chain of them. Each water molecule is going to pull the other one up. Water is able to do that because if you look at it, water has a positive side and a negative side. The little white ball on the right side of the screen with two blue dots is a negative and positive side. So you have two different sides. Therefore, water is considered a polar molecule. The positive side of one can connect to the negative side of the other by hydrogen bonds. So as water evaporates out the leaf, it's able to pull other water molecules up. All because water's polar, it could stick to itself called cohesion. This process of water pulling itself up the tree is called evapotranspiration or just plain old transpiration. That is how water enters a plant. Light. Light is able to be absorbed by chloroplasts and plants because they have a very specific protein that absorbs some wavelengths or colors of light and reflect others. Proteins that reflect certain colors and give anything a color, those proteins that give color are called pigments. And the pigment in plants is known as chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, does it absorb all colors of light? You just said pigments like chlorophyll don't absorb all colors. They absorb a lot, but they reflect certain colors. And if you look at the two graphs over here, the top one shows absorbance, like how well certain colors of light are absorbed by chlorophyll. When you're really high up, that's high absorbance. When you're down low on this graph, it shows low absorbance. What colors of light are highly absorbed? Pretty clear, things like blue and red. Ones that are not absorbed, things like green, yellow, orange, kind of com common colors that we see leaves. So not all colors are absorbed the same. The optimal colors, meaning the best ones that will give photosynthesis the fastest possible re reaction, are things like white light, because white light contains all colors of the rainbow. Red and blue, we mentioned from the graph above, are very good. They're absorbed very well. And on the worst list, meaning what color of light allows for the slowest rate of photosynthesis? Well, black light, zero growth. Black is the absence of light. It's not technically a color. So if there's no light, there's no photosynthesis. So what color color is the worst green green light is mostly reflected and it's reflected back into our eyes which is why we see plants 
as green. Green is reflected, reflected off of chlorophyll back into our eyes. So in summary, how could you speed up or slow down the rate of photosynthesis? Let's look at the speed up one first. Pretty much if you give plants more of what they need, sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, you're probably going to get more photosynthesis occurring. So increase sunlight, increase light intensity. If you just say, oh, light intensity increases photosynthesis, what do you mean? Lower light intensity, higher light intensity, be specific. Increase in light intensity. Also, not just any old light, like if you use green light, that's not going to be good. Use white light or red light or blue light. Those colors of light are optimal for photosynthesis. If you increase water, more photosynthesis will happen. Again, not don't drown the plant in a bath. If you increase CO2, more photosynthesis and what else? There's nothing else. That arrow represents enzymes and enzymes are proteins and proteins are very dependent on the temperature and the pH. They only work in certain temperatures and certain pHs. So plants need to be in their optimal temperature. Right now, if you look outside, if it's winter time, plants aren't growing that well. Grass is not growing because it's so cold outside. It causes the enzymes to work slower. The optimal pH must also be used. Rainwater, slightly acidic because it mixes with the carbon dioxide in the air. That's optimal for those plants. So how could you slow down photosynthesis? Well, if you decrease the stuff that is needed for photosynthesis, you're going to have less photosynthesis. So decrease light intensity. What color of light's the worst? Green, because it's reflected. Decrease water. Decrease CO2. Back to the arrow. If you want to slow down, not totally stop photosynthesis, decrease the temperature because it will slow down the enzymes. If you raise the temperature too much, it will totally stop the process because the enzymes will break down or denature and not work again. You also want to, if you want to slow down photosynthesis, maybe go a little bit away from the optimal pH, meaning a little above or a little below because too far away from the optimal will cause the enzymes to denature as well. So the in-depth look at photosynthesis, how this all happens, there's two specific reactions that occur, the light dependent and light independent. For that, we have to know the parts of a chloroplast. The little pancakes in here are called thylakoids. Stacks of the pancakes or stacks of thylakoids are called grana. And the liquid inside the chloroplast called stroma. The light dependent reactions, of course, they need light. They need sunlight. The sunlight will be really important when it comes to water, as we saw. Sunlight comes in, splits water in two, hydrogen and oxygen. And it looks like the hydrogens became charged. They lost their negative electrons, which got absorbed into the or dropped off into the membrane of the thylakoid, the pancake. The oxygen will join up with another oxygen and become the oxygen we breathe. Those electrons, they don't just hang out there in the photosystem, that bundle of proteins. They're going to actually move through the membrane. And as they move through the membrane, that's going to allow hydrogen to get pumped into the thylakoid. So as these hydrogen ions get pumped into the thylakoid, that's going to create a really high concentration of hydrogen. And outside the thylakoid, we'll have a low concentration, kind of like a tire, highly concentrated air in a tire. And outside the tire is a low concentration of air.
Those electrons are going to get picked up by NADPH+. Plus. The plus meaning is looking for electrons. And it will become NADPH, an electron carrier. It's going to carry electrons to the next process. The hydrogen are going to go from the high concentration in the tire or in the thylakoid to the low concentration out. And they're going to move out by this thing called ATP synthase. Hydrogens will move out. And that motion of moving out, that energy is going to allow ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to join with another phosphate to make adenosine triphosphate, ATP, usable energy. So this whole process of light-dependent reactions occurs in the thylakoid. You need sunlight and water. What's made? Breathable oxygen. We have electron carriers made, and we also have ATP that's made. The ATP and NADPH, those will eventually power the light-independent reactions, also known as the dark reactions. Let's take a look. The light independent reactions, pretty much it's just one big cycle, very important by the way, called the Calvin cycle. This cycle is going to make glucose. And in order to make glucose, you need carbon. C6H12O6, you need six carbons. So you need a lot of carbon dioxide entering this process. And in order for carbon dioxide to be combined and reworked and remade, you need energy to do that. And also an enzyme to facilitate this process. That little enzyme, really powerful enzyme, is called Rubisco. NADPH and ATP will power the process and allow glucose to be made. That's the shortened version of this process. So this occurs in the stroma, in the liquid, in the chloroplast. What's used? You need CO2 to make sugar. And you need something to power it, NADPH and ATP. What's made? The all-important glucose. And that is photosynthesis. Looking at our next process, cell respiration. Purpose of this process, we kind of looked at it a little before, is to make ATP, usable energy. This, or you could think of it as this process extracts, takes energy out of glucose, a nutrient, and makes it into usable energy. This occurs at the organelle is called mitochondria. And it looks like a plant cell has it, an animal cell has it. So what organisms carry out photosynthesis, autotrophs or heterotrophs? Autotrophs do, they make their own food, but they need to make ATP. Heterotrophs, they consume food, but they need to make ATP. So both, all organisms do respiration because all organisms need to make ATP, usable energy to carry out metabolism, their life functions. And if you're a cell and you have more mitochondria, that means that cell has a lot of ATP being made because it might be a muscle cell, which needs a lot of ATP. Some possible equations you could see respiration as. Um, again, glucose is used to make ATP, but if you just use glucose, you're going to make less. And we'll take a look at that one in a sec. First one, aerobic cellular respiration. The word aerobe refers to oxygen. So aerobic cellular respiration is oxygen cellular respiration. You need oxygen. So oxygen and glucose, when they're used to make ATP, oxygen helps get more energy out of glucose, and you make 36 ATP a whole ton. The energy in glucose is extracted and stored in ATP, but ATP is very readily usable energy. Waste products that are made are carbon dioxide, which come from sugar. So when you eat carbohydrates and sugar, 
it's going to be broken down and you're going to breathe out your sugar later as carbon dioxide. Most weight loss occurs by breathing out the weight. The hydrogen and oxygen will become water. So it's kind of like photosynthesis in reverse. But sometimes you can't make, uh, sometimes you can't get enough oxygen, but you still got to make energy. So a process called anaerobic respiration is used. The word aerobes there again, meaning oxygen, but you put the word an in front of it. That means without. So this process anaerobic is without oxygen cellular respiration. In humans or animals, when you just use glucose to make ATP, you only make two, which is nothing. You still make the carbon dioxide, but the liquid's gonna be different. It's gonna be lactic acid. So when you work out for a while, you start to get tired because you're making two ATP, but you also start to feel sore because lactic acid makes you feel sore and tired, also known as fatigue. And other organisms like yeast, they use glucose to make 2-ATP. They make carbon dioxide, but they're going to make alcohol instead. Both processes in animals and yeast, both types of anaerobic respiration are called fermentation. So you might hear something like lactic acid fermentation or alcohol fermentation. It's referring to anaerobic respiration. Lactic acid and alcohol, if you look at all three equations, aerobic and anaerobic, lactic acid and alcohol, they're unique to anaerobic respiration. What's always made during respiration, meaning what's always made when ATP is made? Looks like carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is. So do all organisms make CO2, including plants? Well, this is the... These three equations are the only way respiration happens. So yeah, they do. All organisms make CO2 because all organisms make ATP. ATP and CO2 are always made together. Which set of graphs, number one, represent cellular respiration? We have to identify what's going on in these graphs. Letter A shows increasing CO2 over time, or increasing oxygen over time, sorry. And graph two shows carbon dioxide decreasing over time. In the group of graphs labeled B, oxygen's decreasing and CO2's increasing. So group A or group B, which group shows cellular respiration? Well, cellular respiration uses oxygen so it will decrease it over time and it produces co2 so it will increase co2 over time it looks like b shows cellular respiration decreasing o2 increasing co2 which ones show photosynthesis photosynthesis increases oxygen over time and it takes out co2 takes away co2 from the atmosphere it reduces co2 graphs a, show that. So what organisms, heterotrophs, autotrophs, carry out both the processes above? Heterotrophs, things like us, yeah, we do respiration, but we don't do photosynthesis. Autotrophs, they do respiration. They have to make ATP, and they do photosynthesis because they have to make their own food. Autotrophs because they do both processes, respiration and photosynthesis, to make ATP and make their own food. Looking at the mitochondria up close, there are some parts you got to know. The outer membrane, the inner membrane, called the cristae, the space between them, called the intermembrane space, very appropriate, and in the middle, Named after a movie, The Matrix. It's not The Matrix in the movie, though. And outside is the cytoplasm. Something actually occurs outside the mitochondria. Cellular respiration is a three-step process. Sometimes. Sometimes it's just one. 
It depends on whether oxygen's there or not. Glycolysis, the first thing, it happens aerobically or anaerobically, with or without oxygen. Two and three, the Krebs cycle, only happens in aerobic respiration, and the electron transport chain, only in aerobic respiration. Glycolysis, the first stage, happens again with or without oxygen. Glyco refers to sugar, glucose. Lysis refers to splitting. So this process is the splitting of sugar. It occurs in the cytoplasm. So we're not in the mitochondria yet. It's going to use, of course, sugar, which is split into two, three carbon molecules called pyruvate or pyruvic acid. This process of splitting water, glycolysis, is going to yield or make two ATP total and two NADPH electron carriers. So what was used? Glucose was used and some ATP was used, but we still left off with two net ATP ganged. Two NADPH are made electron carriers, and two pyruvic acid molecules were made. Those will be important for the next two processes. And if no oxygen is present, the whole process of respiration stops here. It does not go any further. So it will end with only two ATP being produced. We know that as anaerobic cellular respiration. So in anaerobic respiration, only glycolysis takes place. This picture shows glycolysis up top. On the right, if no oxygen is present, we just said it stops, leaving you or a plant with only two ATP. And the pyruvates, they'll become lactic acid or alcohol. But if oxygen is present, you can move on to the next two stages and really get a lot of energy out of those pyruvate molecules. Let's take a look at the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. On the upper right, I circled where it occurs. It occurs in the matrix in the center of that mitochondria. It uses two pyruvic acid molecules, two pyruvates, and it will ultimately produce two ATP. So this cycle or process, really what you got to know, you don't have to know the whole cycle and all the intermediates. It's going to make 2 ATP, and it's going to make a ton of electron carriers, 8 NADPH and 2 FADH2s. Those are really important because they're going to bring electrons to the third stage, the electron transport chain, which needs electrons. And they're going to be carried there by NADPH, a little typo there, it should be NADH as a typo, and FADH. And of course, this is where all the CO2 waste is going to be made, or the vast majority of it, in the Krebs cycle. So the main purpose of the Krebs cycle, make electron carriers, make a little ATP, pumps out a whole bunch of CO2 waste, and now on to the real energy maker, the electron transport chain. This occurs in the Christi, the inner membrane, and it's going to use the electron carriers and ultimately produce 34 ATP, a whole ton, much more than two. So this process starts with NADH and FADH2. There, the typo is fixed for that one. NADH is going to drop off an electron, FADH will drop off its electron, and both those now become a little positively charged because they lost their negative electrons. Those electrons will move through the membrane, the Christi, and as that happens, the hydrogens are going to get pumped in. This kind of looks just like the light-dependent reactions in photosynthesis. Hydrogens move in, and now you get a really high concentration in the intermembrane space. 
and the hydrogens are going to want to diffuse from high to low. They're going to diffuse out of here through ATP synthase, and the electrons will hop on to those hydrogens. And now the hydrogens have their one electron each, and they're going to be covalently bonded to oxygen to make water, one of the waste products of respiration. And as the hydrogens move through, that's going to power or allow ADP plus a phosphate to be joined to make ATP. And again, 34 ATP are made. So in summary, these are the three stages of cellular respiration. The bottom two only happen if oxygen are present. Two ATP are made in glycolysis and two electron carriers. Two ATP are made in the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. And a lot of electron carriers plus a lot of CO2 waste. The electron transport chain, this is the big ATP maker here. 34 ATP are made, uses all those electron carriers, and it makes some water waste. So in a perfect world, 38 ATP are made, but nothing's perfect. In the real world, 36 ATP are made. And that is the most ATP that could be made using glucose.